Now, to the agenda today. I think uh, it's uh, natural to start with the escape route because for the listeners who listen to this now, depending on when they're listening to it, you may already have access to our other two shows on the same topic with uh, Cooper of the Shark Hunters and Gerard of uh, the Grey Wolf Approach. Now, all of you three, and even if we include Farrell, who has also touched lightly upon this on another program, you all agree upon many main points but then you have uh, a little different takes on it which is kind of natural because we know what didn't happen but (laughs) to find out what really happened is a a bit more difficult sure and you all are primary researchers so you find you all have your own leads now which escape route of all the potential that we that we know exists and, and and all of them may have been used by different nazis but which one do you think hitler applied well this leads us to a very interesting state of affairs when i published ratline i was of the opinion that uh had hitler escaped he used the monastery route uh he took the monastery route out to out of italy out of europe to south america uh first so that would account for the sightings in argentina yeah, but how did he go from uh, berlin to italy then Oh, I, I would say there was Berlin to Salzburg, ah. and Salzburg across the, the border, across the Italian Tyrol, into Bolzano, uh, and from Bolzano, which was the major uh, transit point uh, for refugees and Nazis uh, escaping justice, uh, from Bolzano got the, the, the paperwork that he needed, the false documentation, and then was secreted either across uh, northern Italy to Genoa, which is where most of the people went. They got onto boats yeah. and went that way. There was a south uh, escape route as well that went down the uh, the eastern coast of Italy and that went to across the Mediterranean to the Middle East to the Suez Canal and then to other places from there. Yeah, but wouldn't it be very risky to put the, 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 the king rat in the most trafficked uh, rat line? Probably uh, he would be safer that way. Oh, okay. Uh, it might it might be that he would just blend in with all the other refugees that were mm-hmm. that were trying to escape. I mean, there were. You have to understand that Bolzano, this is an Italian town in the in the Italian Tyrol. Mm. Bolzano was also known as Bozen. It was a German and Italian town, and at, at the height of this period, 1945, 46, 47, people walked the streets in SS uniforms openly. You know, the Germans were there. No one was arresting them. They were pretty much free to come and go. There's photographs of German soldiers and SS officers uh, in their uniforms hanging out in the, in the, in the cafes in Bolzano. <laughs> right. I mean, it was it was because there was no there was no uh, government. You know, the Italian government had fallen apart. Uh, the Austrian government was chopped up between the, the the Soviets and the British and the Americans and the French. Everybody was carving out a piece of everything. There was chaos. Yeah. So Bolzano was an excellent place to try to hide. Um, a lot of people did. You know, they managed to catch um, uh, some people on their on their way out. They managed to catch, I think, some of uh, Goering's uh, relatives on their way out. Uh, I think some of Mormon's relatives were caught trying to cross that way because they were on the lookout mm-hmm. for them. But if you weren't looking for Hitler, if you were told that Hitler had died and you didn't know that Eva Braun existed, uh, your eyes, you know. You, we've all seen spy movies, right, where <laughs> yeah. if a spy wants to escape, he travels with someone else. Yeah. Because whoever's looking for him is not looking for a couple. They're not looking for a family. They're not looking for a married couple. They're looking for one guy on his own. Mm. And it's just a psychological thing. You're looking for this guy. You have a picture. You have a wanted poster. You're looking for this one guy. A couple shows up. You hardly even notice who they are. And, and of course, and of course, a man he probably has no mustache anymore, and right. he has glasses. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. You know, and he has this blonde mm. companion, you know, who's walking with him. I mean, um, anything would be, would have been possible. So it's possible he could have gotten out that way, or alternatively, there were a lot of rumors that he did leave on a plane, wound up in Denmark, and left that way. Yeah, and, and Joseph's take is the U-boat to yeah. Norway, and then I think it's Spain. Yeah. 
That's and then the and then the bomber Kamler. Yeah. He had uh, a plane, I think, this um, uh, Junker plane yep. that went to to South. And then we know there's a lot of U-boats who who did pop up. I think Cooper of the Shark Hunters. I think his yes. argument is uh, U-boat. Yes. And it makes sense. So there's many possibilities. There's here. many possibilities. I mean, the, mm. the U-boat thing makes excellent possibilities because uh, Admiral Dainitz himself came out and yeah. said we have a place. You know, for Hitler to escape to if he needs it. It's a paradise, you know, and he was the head of the U-boat operation. Mm. He would get Hitler out by U-boat. He ran U-boat uh, uh, fueling stations in northern Spain. Mm. And he was the assigned successor. Exactly. So why not? That makes excellent sense as well. The U-boat escape route makes excellent sense. And we know that U-boats showed up in Argentina, you know, months and months after the end yeah. of the war. Months and months after the end of the war. How was that possible, right? Mm. So it happened. They were able to do that, and they could have gotten anybody out. And there's so many rumors that the U-boats uh, disgorged passengers and, and, uh, and, and artifacts of some kind in Argentina before the U-boats surrendered to the, Aust the Argentine authorities. So, you know. But, but you favor at least then that he, he – the most probable route is that he ended up in Italy, and from there he went to – uh, yeah, Italy seems likely if if everybody else is to be believed. Mm -hmm. The reason I, I go there in this case is because of something very specific. I came across in all this research a, a diary, an address book that was written or kept by an Austrian uh, war criminal. Mm -hmm. And in that particular uh, document, uh, we have the name and address and contact information for Krunoslav Dragonovic, who was the, the Catholic Monsignor, uh, the Croatian who operated out of Salzburg, Austria. We have names and addresses for a lot of other people, some of them prominent Nazis or prominent people in the underground, uh, connection points and all of the rest of it. And this notebook was allegedly uh, in the possession of someone who claimed that he was Hitler himself. Ah. And Ratline was kind of based around this concept. First, hearing from Nick Bellantoni that the skull the Soviets had was not Hitler's, and then hearing rumors that there was an Argentine connection, I mean, excuse me, an Indochina or in Indonesian connection to all of this, led me to, you know, to start unraveling all of this. And I came across a book that was published in the Indonesian language, um, which was an account of Hitler's escape to Indonesia, which on its own, not that convincing, until I saw copies of the documentation which then really got my attention because um, no one could have known this uh, at that time. No one could have known some of the details that were in this book. Uh, the address book itself was extremely suggestive that whoever had it in Indonesia had been a Nazi, was part of the rat line. Mm. And so I had to stop and wait and say, what was the rat line doing extending all the way to Indonesia, to South so, Asia? So Indonesia was not one of the common rat line end stops? Not at all. It was never mentioned. Asia was never but, mentioned. But it is a Muslim country. Absolutely. So it would be one of the safe havens um, for Nazis. It's not, not only a Muslim country, but the man who became the first president of Indonesia, Sukarno, had made speeches during World War II in favor of the Nazis and in favor of the Japanese uh, empire. So he was uh, had definite pro-Nazi sympathies, at least during World War II. Um, he would have been considered somebody who was congenial, you know, to, to, to using his country as a safe haven for Nazis and for Nazi gold, let's not forget. Um, we found out, or I found out during the course of the investigation, that uh, 40 tons of Nazi gold made its way out of Portugal to Macau. Uh, and from Macau, 20 tons of that gold went into China, and another 20 tons of gold went to Indonesia. Um, we don't know what that was paying for, but then we have this guy showing up, in Indonesia uh, with this document showing how he escaped uh, the Allied forces in Austria, in Salzburg, wound up in northern Italy, and then from northern Italy wound up with a big uh, missing piece in there, but somehow wound up in Indonesia uh, in the 1950s. So that got me thinking, that got me researching, and that's what happened. That's how Ratline was born. And then after Ratline was published, I was able to actually see some of this original documentation for myself, I made a trip to Indonesia and to Singapore, and I was able to see uh, a lot of this documentation and to satisfy myself that it was genuine and to uh, to do some more research on the ground to determine whether or not 
this person who escaped was actually Hitler or not. Mm. So this was part of the research that I did. It does not discount the research done by Cooper and others that there was there was Hitler sightings in Argentina. For the longest time, I felt the same way. I felt that Hitler might have wound up in Indonesia uh, at the end, but that he could easily have used Argentina as a stopping off place uh, to stay there for a year or two before he went on to Indonesia. Yeah, yeah, because my thought has always been, because I've known your theories and the others, uh, my thought has always been that uh, no matter where he ended up, immediately after the war, Hitler, unlike Bormann, was completely dependent. I mean, he's 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 the head leech, so he needed people. And if we should believe the reports about his uh, state of mind and his health and all that, so he needed people to help him. Yeah. And since you yourself say that there wasn't a populated rat line to Indonesia, at least he needed to come to the already established Bariloche, Patagonia, all this stuff sure. first, at least, sure. uh, by the protection of Bormans and others. And then, well, you can take it from there. So, so you're still open that oh, certainly. his first route was Argentina. It's possible. I've mm. seen more documentation on this person who lived and died in Indonesia uh, to show that there is a, a lacuna in, in, in this whole story. For some reason, uh, he sails, the person that I'm talking about who, who wound up in Indonesia, sailed from the Netherlands uh, on a Dutch uh, ship uh, in the 1950s, although he had escaped in 1946 to northern Italy. So there is this, huh. there is a space of time. Uh, for which I have no documentation. I don't know where he was or what he was doing for about six years. So he, so in that notebook, uh, there was yeah. a void of uh, yes. notes. Absolutely. There's a, there's a void of, of, okay. of information completely. Have that been removed or was it just that it wasn't a, a chronological diary? It wasn't. I, I don't think it was removed. I think it just simply wasn't chronological. I think that... Mm. Part of the problem was the passport. This guy had a passport issued by the West German government at the time and had not been used at all uh, until a certain specific time. That doesn't mean he didn't travel under another passport, under another name, and wound up in another country. But for some reason, it was around 1952 or so, when this gentleman decided, I'm going to leave via uh, Antwerp and wind up in Jakarta. So uh, there's this period of six years when I have no idea what he was doing. He had all the information he needed, including a, uh, a source for Spanish language lessons is in that book. Wow. Uh, everything is there for him to get out of town and get to Argentina. Did he go or not? I don't know. Um, but this is my feeling. Would Hitler... Bit, yes, go on. Yeah, sorry. No, no, no. You go on. I was going to say, would Hitler have felt secure in Argentina among a lot of Nazis... When they had tried to kill him in July of 44, when Himmler had betrayed him by going straight to the Nazis, to the Americans to cut his own side deal, mm. when everything was falling apart around him, would Hitler have been secure in Argentina, surrounded by people who may decide exactly. to feather their own nest by dropping a dime on him, as we used to say, by calling the authorities and having him picked up? I think Hitler would have eventually found himself feeling pretty nervous. Yeah. In those circumstances, and maybe he thought to himself, maybe I better get out of Dodge while I still can. And, you know, I grew up with a guy, called, not grew up, but I went to war with a guy called Walter Hale, uh, who was a famous uh, Indonesian expert who had spent 10 years in Indonesia in the 1920s, uh -huh. who told me all these great stories about Indonesia. He was like the last guy to leave the bunker in May of 45. We don't know what happened to him. Hang on. So this childhood friend of Hitler was in the bunker with Hitler. Yeah, not a childhood friend, but he went with, he was part of the Beer Hall Putsch in 1923. Yeah, okay. He marched with Hitler. He was arrested with Hitler, went to jail with Hitler. He was one of the old guard, one of the old true believers. He was a kid at the time. He was a teenager uh, when he marched with Hitler and Himmler at the Putsch. Um, and wound up in prison. But then he got out and went to Indonesia, stayed there for 10 years, came back and became kind of an ambassador without portfolio. He hung out with Hitler, told Hitler all his great stories about life in Indonesia and all the rest of it. And then at the end, of, he's one of the last people to leave the bunker, one of the last people allegedly to see Hitler alive, uh, disappears into Berlin in May of 1945, is never heard from again. He's another guy who escapes that we don't know anything right. about. 
But that means that while Hitler was building up his Third Reich, this guy was in Indonesia making a career there. Uh, While he was building up his Nazi party, when Hitler became Chancellor of Germany, he called Walter Havel back from Indonesia Ah, and then helped him to build up the Third Reich. Yeah, and it makes perfect sense because eventually Hitler must have realized that he cannot trust Bormann, that Bormann is in it for his own and that Bormann wants to be the new king. Yeah. So uh, if he was uh, smuggled out uh, with the help of Bormann or by his protection, at some point even Hitler must have realized that I'm kept in the dark here. And then I guess the big question is, did he wither away? Like the Grey Wolf take is that he died lonely, sick, bitter. Even Eva Brown and her kids left him. Or did he, you know, move on? which I think most people in in his shoes would probably try to do that. Now, a very timely question then is, if you are the most well-known, most hated uh, escapee of the time, you are somewhere in Patagonia in the 50s, what would be the most natural route to get to Indonesia? Would it be to cross the... uh, uh, sea of uh, what you call it in English Sea of Silence uh, Pacific Sea yeah. or would it be to go cr- across the Atlantic and then for instance through through Netherlands what would be the most logical choice I mean the <laughs> geography hasn't changed but given the possibilities of the day the political technical climate of the day certainly you would have gone by by ship air travel at that point was not that common international air travel would have been uh, expensive and also you would have been too conspicuous i think you would have gone by boat under any circumstances uh, it's possible you could have gone uh, back to europe and taken that route if you felt secure enough to do so that you weren't really going back into the lion's den to go back to europe no not in the 50s no no, no not in the 50s it was over but i'm thinking that the, maybe the travel arrangement was easier that way at that point? From Europe, I think it was easier because mm. you could catch a ship at Antwerp that would take you directly there. It would stop briefly in Egypt at the Suez Canal and then wouldn't stop again until they reached, in this case, the documentation I saw was Sri Lanka. Yeah. And then from Sri Lanka to Singapore, Singapore to Jakarta, which is how that particular route went. And we know there are Nazis in Egypt and uh, on the road. Oh, yeah. yeah. That no. wasn't a problem. Uh, what, what we do know also is that Indonesia, at that point, the Indonesian people in general would not have been that aware of Hitler, of what Hitler looked like or all the rest of it. They had their own problems. They just fought um, a revolution, a rebellion against the Dutch Mm. uh, after they had been invaded by the Japanese. They were they had their own problems and the Nazis were a world away. There was no Internet. You know, Mm. uh, newspapers were few and far between. Most of the people living were living in an agricultural life in Indonesia. It would have been the perfect place for him to go Mm. uh, and not be noticed, except as another crazy white guy, you know. (laughs) And the man that I'm talking about did not choose to live in Jakarta, in the the capital of the country. He went to a a far removed island on the other side of Bali, you know, all the way in a remote part of the Indonesian archipelago. So there he is functioning in this little remote area. And he tells, um, he has a wife there. You know, an Eva Braun lookalike Mm. who then uh, leaves him in the 1960s and goes back to Europe. So he's there on his own. Interesting. So in your scenario, he's also left. Ah, Yes, he's also left. He marries a local woman, converts to Islam. Wow. To marry this woman and becomes a Muslim. So, you know, all these wild stories. And there's there's photographs of this guy um, and there's his grave. Uh, He goes in 1970, January of 1970, to the city of Surabaya, a very big port city in Indonesia. Mm. We don't really know why he does this, because he never wanted to leave that island. He was paranoid about leaving the island. He knew what would happen if he left. So even though his wife made several trips back and forth to Europe and back to Indonesia, he would never accompany her. He would never leave the island. He wanted to stay on the island. But for some reason, in January of 1970, he seems to have an appointment. He has to see someone in Surabaya. And this is concerning the documentation that I saw. Yeah. He winds up in Surabaya and he dies the next day. Um, uh, just, just what dies? I mean, uh, he's dead. He's dead. He's in a hospital. He's dead. Uh, we don't know the cause of death. We don't know what that was all about. All we know is that there's a picture of him as a corpse in a small hospital in Surabaya. Right. I went there. 
Uh, and then I went to the cemetery where he's buried. Now, to add to this mystery even more, uh-huh. I went to the cemetery. The headstone, and everybody knows this headstone because it became famous in Indonesia mm-hmm. once this Hitler story started to come out. Uh, and when was this? When did it come out in Indonesia? Just recently. It came out in the... Oh, okay. Yeah, just... just. I mean, it came out first in the 1980s. Uh, there's a long story involving that. And then it was quashed by the Suharto government, which was uh, in charge. Interesting. Interesting. And it was quashed by that government. Mm. The man who broke the story was a military officer and a medical officer. And they told him basically to shut up and stop talking. And, and he did. Um, and then he died. And then... The long story ensues, documentation passes between the relatives to someone else, and then the story comes out again. An arms dealer in Indonesia now starts to pursue the story, somebody with ties to Moscow. I mean, it's it's rife wow. with all this conspiratorial stuff, but it's all documented, you know. Yeah. So I, I go to the cemetery and I look at the tombstone, and there's no dates of birth or death on the tombstone. Huh. They have his name. Yeah. They don't, it's not Adolf Hitler, it's a Georg Anton Poich. Could you repeat that name? Georg Anton Poich, P O umlaut C H. Okay, so so that's a German name. Yeah, and they have his name, but that's the that's the the cover name. That's the name that he was going under, mm. and he's buried there. But if you know anything about Islamic cemeteries and Islamic tombs, I'm sure, I'm assuming you don't. Um, you cannot bury somebody without the without the date of their birth and the date of their death, mm. especially not the date of their death, right? Mm-hmm. This is the only tombstone in that entire cemetery that does not have those dates on it hmm. because they really didn't know who's there. Right. They don't know when that person was born, and even the death date evidently seems to be up for grabs. It seems to be controversial. So it's one of the most – it's the strangest thing that I've seen. I have a photograph taken there. I've taken some film footage. Yeah, I've seen it. It is a bizarre uh, uh, thing. But he died in January of 1970. And as we talked about at the top of the show, Yuri Andropov of the KGB, mm. in April of 1970, then orders his people to dig up the bodies they have of Hitler and destroy ah, them completely. There's a connection. Yeah. And also, uh, it, uh, you can't ignore the fact that they... I mean, if the government in Indonesia didn't have something to hide, they would probably encourage such a story. It could mean tourism, it would put them on the map. Yeah, uh, it's it's a peculiarity. Sure, but if it's something serious behind it, there was something serious. Suharto yeah. and his government came down on this very hard. I, I've I've gone through a lot of documentation on this, a lot of which I was not allowed to include because of of, of arrangements with the owners of the documentation. Oh. Uh, however, uh, I do have a photograph of a couple of pages of that documentation in the Hitler legacy mm-hmm. to show that this is really this is genuine stuff. Um, and I, again, included a lot of other uh, additional information. I have more, which I'm waiting to publish. I'm just waiting for an okay to do so. Uh, that might happen this year or next year. And if so, then the whole story will come out to the satisfaction, I think, of historians. But wow. at this point, um, I'm not convinced. I want to be very clear to everybody listening. I am not convinced the man who died in Indonesia was Adolf Hitler. Mm. I am 100% convinced this was a war criminal. This was somebody who was fleeing for his life, mm. uh, who used the rat lines to escape, who was intimate with the details of the rat lines in ways that I have not found anywhere else, and that this is the actual uh, notebook of a person who escaped along those lines that has survived the war. So all of this is important, and I think that there is a lot of additional information that's yet come to light on the extent of this guy's relationships with some very famous names uh, in the Nazi underground. So I'm waiting for, as I say, permission to release this information. And then when I have it, you're going to, to see there's a lot more depth to the story than, than I realized when I started it. But it is something, it's, it's phenomenal. It's, it's a rat line that extended all the way to a remote island in Indonesia. So it's uh, great stuff. Yeah, which is a perfect hideout. Retired people today. I mean, Bali, for instance, is a very popular. Oh, yeah. It's like it's an island in the sun, right? Sure. So what better place to put your your hero <laughs> if he's going yeah. to live out the rest of his days uh, irrelevant to what's going on in the world scene? Put him to <laughs> something very resembling of paradise. 
Um, sure. Which is away from the world public. And which brings me back to that National Lampoon cover, you know, yeah. the fiddler in a bamboo chair <laughs> with a tropical drink. So, so life <laughs> imitates art or the yeah. other way around. Yeah. Yeah. But you said there was a photo connected. By the way, this man, no matter who he was, if he was so connected, he must have been an important man. And there's not that many exactly. candidates. Exactly. And there's one more wrinkle to the story. Mm -hmm. And the wrinkle only came to light after my, my three books were published. Uh, I have a, a website where I, this has been discussed and brought up, and I've talked about it uh, there. Uh, one of my readers, a very close reader, as we call them, had gone through Ratline and then went through Hitler Legacy and noticed a connection that I had, never, that I had not noticed myself. Okay. Actually identified a mystery and revealed it. Uh, this is a person who lives in Europe, who's familiar with the German language very well and all the rest of it. So this was a very good uh, background credentials for this sort of thing. Mm. Came and pointed out to me the fact that one of the notations from this man's notebook that I could not understand, that I could not decipher, mm -hmm. that I mentioned in Ratline, I inadvertently, without knowing it, referred to it in Hitler Legacy in a different, completely different context, which is why I didn't see it. Okay. There was a bank, a small bizarre little bank in Jakarta called the PT Galaxy Trust. And this little bizarre bank uh, on a remote street, on a side street somewhere, I think it's not really a bank like a commercial bank, a retail bank. I think it's more of a, of a, you know, a private bank, was dead center in the midst of one of the biggest scandals uh, in Indonesian history of the 20th century, which was involving something called the Sukarno Revolutionary Fund mm -hmm. and involving the gold certificates, uh, uh, Sukarno's gold certificates. This was a, a bizarre story. Um, there was a man called Demonic, who was an Indonesian former police officer who was involved with the bank, who had access, who had possession of certificates for billions of dollars. I'm not exaggerating, billions of dollars worth of gold which allegedly belonged to Sukarno and Sukarno's heirs. He tried to negotiate these instruments in the United States mm. at the Federal Reserve, was promptly arrested, and then promptly released, went back to Indonesia and mysteriously died. When was this, approximately? Uh, this was quite uh, recently, uh, in the 1990s, I believe, is the latest. I think he died before the 21st century. So late yeah, 19 I've heard about this scandal. Yeah. Well, the address of that bank is the address in the notebook of the German who died in 1970. Wow. When the reader pointed this out to me, saying, you're talking about the same thing, suddenly the whole thing began to become a lot clearer. There is a tremendous scandal in Indonesia over this, mm. and the Revolutionary Fund was supposedly the brainchild of Hitler's finance minister, Helmar Schacht. Mm. Helmar Schacht uh, survived the war and then went on to become an advisor to various international governments, including the government of Sukarno mm. in Indonesia. He recommended to Sukarno to create a kind of crescent uh, of resistance against uh, communist China, uh, and to create a kind of new caliphate, uh, an Islamic state. Mm. He recommended this to Sukarno to create this buffer zone, and then he was involved in talking about how to finance it. Uh, this is around the time when you know 20 tons of Nazi gold made its way into Indonesia to Sukarno's regime. Right. And it's when this bank was set up, it's when our German arrives in Indonesia, and then he and his wife, whoever they are, each have an account at this bizarre, unknown, you know, anonymous bank in Jakarta. Mm. And then, of course, he dies in 1970. She, she died. She disappears. We don't know when she died. She completely disappears off the face of the earth. But you said she went back to Europe. She went back to Europe and disappears. How do you know she went back to Europe? Uh, I have documentation to that effect. Oh, okay. Mm. Yeah, so I'm satisfied on that. She sent a letter back to her husband in Indonesia, and I've seen the envelope and the, the, the stamp and the franking on the envelope and everything else. So she definitely was there. But you haven't seen the letter? The letter, no, never survived. Oh. 
So there's a lot of mystery to this, but the mystery is obviously connected to Nazi gold, yeah. the Sukarno Revolutionary Fund, the famous gold certificates, and the deaths of a number of people surrounding this particular scandal. But didn't, uh, what was his name, the leader of the Indonesian um, country? Sukarno? Sukarno. Was that his name? Yeah. yeah. Didn't he do something with the gold, uh, get away with it or something? I, I forgot yeah. the details. Yeah, what happened was there was the famous Bandung Conference, uh, which was the Conference of Non-Aligned Nations, which was he was setting up to, to uh, say, plague on both your houses. No to the United States, no to Russia. You know, we're going to have our own World Bank, our own International Monetary <laughs> Fund. You know, screw all of you guys. He's thinking big. Really? Uh, yeah, <laughs> this is what he was doing. And he said, we're going to create the revolutionary... I'm so confident. Yes. I'm so confident. Yeah. There must be a reason. Anyway, continue. Yeah, so he created the Revolutionary Fund for this reason. It was going to help finance other countries. They wouldn't have to go to the United States or to China or to Russia or anywhere else. Mm. They'd be independent. They'd have their own independent source of, of wealth mm. that they could draw upon. Of course, Sukarno didn't last. Uh, he was deposed and then he died. Suharto took over. But during Suharto's regime, the successor to Sukarno, yeah. who created the military regime, a uh, military dictatorship mm. in Indonesia, word came out about the Revolutionary Fund. And one of Sukarno's deputies, one of his uh, cabinet ministers, was in jail, in prison, in Jakarta. And he went and told Suharto, okay, if you cut a deal with me, I'll let you know where the fund is. Oh. And that was reported in the Singaporean press, the Indonesian press. This was, this was a real news story, not some conspiracy thing. It was right there in the, in the major news. I have copies of the articles. And this guy is saying, I know where it is. I know what it is. You know, we have to cut a deal. You have to let me out. And then suddenly there's a news blackout on this. Suharto controlled the press. He controlled, you know, the censorship apparatus. We never heard anything more about it. Hmm. And then, you know, in the 80s and the 90s, then we have a guy like Demonic, who is running this bank, and it says, my goodness, I have these gold certificates. Let me see if I can negotiate them. They are supposed to be only negotiated by Sukarno's heirs, the heirs to that to that fortune. Which is Suharto. Well, Suharto's dead. I mean, no, 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 Sukarno's blood relatives, not Suharto. Oh, right, 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 right. Sukarno's actual blood relatives are the only ones who should be able to, to cash these in. Mm. The problem is some of Sukarno's relatives are fighting to get this money released, mm. but they can't find it. They can't find the gold. They have certificates, which are kind but of not to back it up, right? Not, they don't know. They don't know who has it. Mm. And then there's other relatives um, who are saying, well, you know, uh, Megawati being one of them, uh, one of Sukarno's relatives, saying, well, you know, we don't know if this gold really exists, but if it does, it belongs to the Indonesian people. I mean, there's this idea that the Revolutionary Fund exists that it's Nazi gold. Mm. We know a lot of Nazi gold was buried. A lot of Japanese gold was buried in the Indonesian ar ar archipelago in the immediate uh, last months of the war in, in the Pacific. We know that was going on. We know that uh, some gold was found in the Philippines. That made a very famous case in the United States. Yeah. A lawsuit against, um, a lawsuit against uh, um, you know, the, the Philippine government, mm. uh, against the Marcos regime. Yeah. And the, the guy who found the gold won, actually, against the Marcos regime. Mm. The United States courts awarded the Filipino ownership of this gold, which uh, still has not been recovered because it's been misplaced, hidden, mm. uh, et cetera, et cetera. They're, they're fighting this thing tooth and nail. Um, so we know there's a lot of gold. We know that a lot of this stuff exists. Uh, we know that Sukarno was part of it. We know the Philippines were part of it. Jap Japan was part of it. The Nazi gold floating around the world. And now we have this strange guy, you know, who dies in, in Indonesia in 1970, who left behind documentation suggesting that he was part of this operation, that somehow he had access to this gold. Mm. So we're still following the story. I'm still following it. Wow. I'm trying to find out the rest of it, but I'm being very careful because yeah. whoever goes after this, uh, you know, yeah. in a very... This is touchy. Yeah. This is still uh, something. I mean, haven't you noticed that all the gold in the world seems to be disappearing? Oh, yeah. So it seems that someone is collecting all the gold. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, and there's there are all these reports. Oh, it couldn't possibly be. We know exactly how much gold there is in the world, uh, on and on. And it really bullshit. It, it, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was be more polite, but yes, bullshit. Yes. Yeah, I mean, Fort Knox is empty. Yeah. And you know, you're mentioning Yalmar Shaft. Uh, Don't you think he was? I mean, he was. Uh, 
so insider that even after the war, absolutely. he must have been connected to the post-war Nazi state, don't you think? Absolutely. No, mm. no question in my mind whatsoever. Mm. Mm. All the research I've done on Schacht, especially his post-war movements, it's obvious that he was very much involved. He was involved with um, some of the financiers, the Nazi financiers operating out of Switzerland. They were helping to raise money, for instance, to defend Adolf Eichmann when he was on trial in Jerusalem. There was, there, I mean, Schacht was in the middle of a lot of the stuff. Ah, so they didn't, they didn't turn their back on those that were captured by the Mossad. They actually, Abs- absolutely not. Huh. No, no, not at all. Huh. So, yeah, so the last Nazis who were taken was Barbie or no uh, Eichmann? Eichmann was the last one. No, Barbie was the last Barbie one. Was the last Barbie one. was apprehended in the 1980s. He was extradited finally and wound up in France in the 80s, and that's when this story again took on a different hue. Because in the 1980s, we not only have Klaus Barbie being arrested, and for the first time, the rat lines are being exposed, and the name of Junoslav Dragunovic is being. Uh, mentioned about openly, uh, the Croatian priest who started the rat lines. Mm. This is the 1980s um, when this happens. And then there's the famous uh, case of the Hitler diaries. I don't know if anybody remembers that, but in the 1980s, it was claimed that someone had found Hitler's personal diaries, volumes and volumes of handwritten journals. Excuse me, are these those that were debunked by this British historian who who became a revisionist? What's his name? Um, David Irving. Irving. Is this the same diaries that he debunked? Same diaries. Right. In fact, the diaries were actually verified by none other than Hugh Trevor Roper, the guy who invented Hitler's <laughs> suicide story, he's the guy who said, oh, yes, these diaries are genuine. Rupert Murdoch was buying them for millions of dollars. Yeah, a big story, big yeah. story in the day. Big story yeah. at the time. Mm. So in the 80s, there was all this talk about Nazis, all this talk about escape Nazis. Hitler was back in the news. All of this was going on in the 1980s, mm. uh, which is when one of, my, one of the people involved in the Indonesian story then realized the documents he had in his hand and the person that he had physically seen on this remote island in Indonesia was Hitler. He put that story together in the 1980s when he saw the Klaus Barbie story, the wow. Ratline story. Uh, he had physically seen this man on this island back in 1960. Mm. And then suddenly he's the one who broke the story in the 1980s and then was hushed up by Suharto's government and told not to talk about it. I talked to his relatives mm. in Indonesia. I talked to uh, his daughter who was so frightened by what had happened uh, with all of the the mystification that was going on and all of the intelligence guys who were involved in this thing and all kinds of people from foreign countries who were all over this story. Mm. She actually became a nun. Uh, (laughs) Seriously. You know, and, you know, this this whole thing just scared scared the hell out of her. And the Germans, there were Germans who were visiting this man uh, in, in, uh, in Bandung, in uh, in Indonesia, visiting him and offering him millions of Reichsmarks, uh, uh, Deutschmarks, excuse me, at the time uh, in the 1980s for these documents. They wanted ownership of the documents and he wouldn't sell them, which is how they eventually wound up in Singapore. And that's a long story, too. But there, there was tremendous interest in the 1980s. And there was a possibility that this would have been a, an even bigger story than Klaus Barbie and the Hitler Diaries hoax. Yeah. But Suharto's government would not allow this story to go out. But you maintain that the diaries are a hoax, right? The diaries are a hoax. Yeah. A very clever hoax. I mean, pages and pages in, in, in a very good facsimile of Hitler's own handwriting. Mm. But they're mostly excerpts from Mein Kampf and some other sort of correspondence and easily proven to be to be a hoax. A bit like the, uh, the Howard Hughes uh, diaries hoax, which was happening in the 1970s. You know, mm-hmm. uh, people don't remember that very well, but there was a guy called Clifford Irving, uh, who was an author who got involved in fabricating uh, diaries of the famous uh, wealthy businessman Howard Hughes. And then Howard Hughes himself was still alive, though. <laughs> so he was able to say, no, 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 no. Yeah. Although he had not been seen, but he was still alive. Yeah. That's not so clever of a hoax, though. Not so clever. But no. the, those Hitler diary hoax, didn't Hitler live then, if he, Hitler was this guy? Or was it in the 70s you said he died? Uh, this guy died in January of 1970. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, so then he was dead, no matter. Yeah. But you said there was a photo of him. Yeah. Now, I think I've seen this photo. But what do you think? Do you think he looks like um, he could have been Hitler just by the look of him? Well, he does. He does. The photos of this man in Indonesia do not look like Hitler 
looked from his World War II photos. But he does look remarkably like Hitler looked in his World War I photos, when Hitler was emaciated, when uh, he had lost a lot of weight. Uh, just subtract the weight. Look, I, I, I juxtapose the pictures of Hitler in the trenches in World War I with the photograph of this guy in Indonesia, and they're, they are remarkably similar. Oh, could you send that to us so we could include it as illustrations for this program? Sure. It's, it's in Ratline. Okay. I believe it is. Let me, mm. let me see, make sure that it is so I don't lead you astray. I have a lot of Hitler photographs, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not seeing. It must be in Hitler Legacy then. Okay. I know I, I reproduced the photos. I'm just not finding the right ones. No, but I, I've seen many so-called post-war photos of Hitler. Some are fakes, of course, but some are, you know, just suggestions. Sure. So uh, it's a kind of a blurry for me now. Which one this is? Uh, now I'm looking for my photographs, and I really don't find the one I'm looking for. Uh, so I'll send you a copy. Uh, I have that, uh, I think, readily available. Yeah, we'll find it and put it in as an illustration. Because yeah, I, think, yeah. I think when people see these things, yeah. it's a little easier to understand. Uh, sure. Because there's so many candidates uh, of who, who Hitler was, and, and some of them don't even look like him. I mean, have you heard about this father or something in South America? I forgot his name. Very exotic name. Oh, yeah. Mm? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard about that as well, mm. sure. Yeah. I don't think he looks like Hitler at all. No. <laughs> no. But so, that's, so, so the first thing, they need to look a little alike. Of course, there could have been surgery going on, yeah. even though it's a long time ago. They did plastic surgery at the day. So so we have to take heed for that, sure. too, of course. I think that there's a, there's the plastic surgery, of course, once you bring that in, then it could be anything. But mm. So you can look at the, the picture of Hitler in the trenches mm. when he's, like I say, he's emaciated because he basically was starving for most of his youth. And then you look at Hitler, uh, look at the picture of this, this Austrian, in Indonesia uh, in the nineteen in the late nineteen sixties, and you'll see a remarkable resemblance between those two. So he was an Austrian, even. He was Austrian. You know that. Yes, I have. I have that documentation. Wow. He's an Austrian. He was born about the same year, if the documentation is correct. They were exactly the same height, wow. which is very important. As Dr. Bellantoni told me, the most important thing is if they're the same height, because you can't fake height. No. Um, so if they're the same height, that's a very good indication, mm. and they are exactly the same height. So there's a lot of similarities between the two. It's possible this was another double or, or you know, or, or something. But the man had access to the to the fund. He had access to the gold. Yeah. Um, he lived a long life after the war in Indonesia. He had a wife who looked kind of like Eva, and uh, you know, died mysteriously and just before you know the, the Soviets dug up the other body in Germany. So there's a lot of synchronistic connections between these two people. I don't know if this is Hitler. I'm not insisting that it is. But I'm saying since we don't know anything now about the assassin, about the suicide, um, let's keep an open mind and revisit this whole story. Yeah, and this sounds like a good candidate. Even the death is, I think, a kind of a corroboration here because... You told me that suddenly he had to go to the hospital, right? Yes. And the day after he was dead. Yeah. Now, that's just one of two possibilities as far as I see it. One, he got a sudden illness yeah. and it went bad. Yeah. But the second one is that, uh, because you didn't say that he got ill, just that he had to suddenly go somewhere, right? Right. Yes. So, yes, yeah. he could have been summoned and then killed. Well, he was summoned. I think in the notebooks that I've seen, mm -hmm. there's a strange enigmatic notation uh, of a meeting he was having at a hotel in Surabaya. Now, he had not gone to Surabaya. He just didn't want to leave his island. But for some reason, he had a meeting he had to attend with a man with a European-sounding name, not with a local Indonesian, in Surabaya at that time. So he goes to a meeting and doesn't recover from it. Huh. So was he murdered? Uh, was it simply uh, a coincidence? Did he have a heart attack? Uh, what happened? You know, or was or did Borman pull his <laughs> yeah. stunt? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking Borman. <laughs> I'm thinking Borman too. Or you know, maybe Mossad finally got got religion and said, okay, yes. let's get rid of this guy once and yeah. for all. Yeah. We we can't do it officially. Let's do it on the coverly because enough yeah. people hated him. Yeah, but if Hitler actually had access to to this money, it's a bigger incentive to take him out than if he sure. was just pushed away somewhere. Oh yeah, hmm. 
Oh yeah, and this is remember this is before the whole revolutionary fund became really news. Nobody even knew about it except Sukarno and his cronies and his inner circle and the heads of governments that he's setting this fund up, you know, to, to for. And something else is is important to understand too about this particular gentleman who died in 1970. In 1965, which is the famous year of living dangerously in Indonesia, when Sukarno's regime was about to be overthrown because it was believed he was in bed with Chinese communists. Mm. There was a tremendous massacre of suspected communists on the island of Bali. This idyllic island yeah. was host to uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of people, according to one account, who were massacred on the island for being communists. That time, at that very time, our man in Indonesia, this Austrian, decides to visit Bali. At a time when these communists are being massacred. This guy who, who really doesn't want to leave his island. He never wants to leave his island. Suddenly. He suddenly goes to Bali. And this is in the words of his Muslim wife that he married after the other, the European woman, went back to Europe. Hmm. So she's saying, I don't know, he said he went to Bali. He was going to visit some famous people from his country, uh, something like that, those words like that. And then he comes back and he's very happy about it. <laughs> uh, and he and he actually, he's happy, of course, they're killing communists, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so this, he, this is a guy that was being protected by the Sukarno regime, you know, hmm. uh, for the money but also maybe for ideological reasons. Yeah, and who do you call upon to kill a bunch of communists? Right. Obviously, you call upon these crazy Nazis. The experts. Yes. <laughs> yeah, the guys who are, have been doing it for decades. Yes, exactly. Yes, his old war uh, yeah, buddies. His old war buddies. So now we go to reminiscence and have a perfect view of his uh, heavenly uh, yeah. <laughs> experience. And raise a glass of schnapps, you know. Yeah. <laughs> in a beautiful Bali beach, yes. Exactly. Oh, yeah. oh, my God. But you've been there. There must have been stories about this man from the locals. It's not that many white people, and even if they have no clue who he is, oh, yeah. you must have... Did you collect stories? Oh, about yeah. What did he do there? What, what was his alibi to be there? He was running a clinic on this remote island. He was pretending to be a doctor. Wow, before you say anything else, that's the exact same cover story they used in South America. Yeah. Huh. This was a very useful cover story. Carlton Brunner also was using that until he was picked up. But he was going to do the same thing. He was going to escape and become a doctor and had a doctor's bag mm. and the, the actual documentation of a real doctor, not an invented one. So he he was going to be a doctor. Uh, the story about Hitler in South America that, that you're talking about, also he was a doctor. And in this island, he also was a doctor. Now, the man's name that he was using, Georg Anton Puch, mm. um, was a real doctor, had been chief medical officer in Salzburg for the Nazis. Ah, they used a real name, a real person. They used a real name. Yeah. Mm. Now, I have had the tremendous good fortune to have been contacted just a couple of months ago by someone who knew him. Wow. Uh, someone who uh, grew up in Austria at the time, mm -hmm. who knew both Georg Anton Poich and his wife, a very famous anthropologist called Hella Poich, and told me this aspect of the story, and her understanding is that George Anton was not a real doctor. He had studied medicine, but was more of a, um, a person who did statistical research and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. was not an actually a functioning doctor, just had you know medical training, but was not actually functioning as a doctor, became chief medical officer for political reasons. Could not actually operate a stethoscope, you know. No. And now the stories that I got totally independently from the Indonesians in Indonesia uh, on site was this guy was a doctor, but he wasn't really a doctor. He didn't really know much about medicine. And the man who had first seen him in 1960 uh, and then started reporting the story in the 1980s said precisely the same thing. And he is or was, he passed away a few years ago, was a medical officer, was a, a trained doctor. Mm. Um, had been trained both by the Indonesian government, but also had a Western training. And so this guy pretended to be a doctor running a clinic, but he had no medical training. Hmm. So we're dealing with a mysterious person claiming to be a doctor, claiming to run a clinic, you know, in the middle of nowhere, but, <laughs> yeah. you know, was not actually a doctor. I mean, this is like shades of the boys from Brazil or something. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, it, it, they all... Uh, it seems that the popular business of Nazis after the war was becoming priests or doctors. Priests or doctors, yeah. But, yeah. but I, I bet you that it's not so bad of a cover because Hitler had war experience and in the front line uh, in the First World War, I bet you picked up some stuff about uh, what you call it war not war doctoring but you know what I mean like sure. just primitive uh, stuff yeah. to survive in the sure battlefield medics uh, that sort of thing exactly yeah. yeah sure war wounds that kind of thing so it's enough to pull it off for some ignorant uh, primitives in wherever he lived right so I remember he had tremendous uh, conversations long conversations with Morel and some of the other physicians who were treating him for various things so he was he was a hypochondriac as far as we know and was always talking Talking to doctor. Who was Hitler or Hitler. this guy? Hitler. Mm, mm, mm. So Hitler was a hypochondriac, a famous guy who thought he had all kinds of diseases. Uh, he was he was evidently af- afraid that he might have syphilis, which is why he got involved with Doctor Morell in the first place, who specialized in those types of illnesses, mm. uh, sexually transmitted diseases. Mm. And Morell stayed, you know, uh, a part of Hitler's entourage right up until almost the end. And was giving him, you know, all sorts of, you know, stuff like cocaine and heroin and morphine and mm. a bunch of other stuff as well. So Hitler knew his way around a hypodermic syringe. He knew his way around the yeah. the, the pharmacology a little bit. Um, he oh, could yeah. talk- Many yeah. drug addicts are wonderful when it comes to sure. <laughs> insight into these things even yeah, yeah. today. But yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's funny because. Um, Hitler, if he was in a clinic, who paid him? I mean, who set up this clinic? Why was there a clinic there? Exactly my point. Exactly my point in this whole research. I couldn't figure out how he could afford to live there, which is what eventually this whole thing with the bank suddenly opened my eyes as to what was going on because he arrives in Indonesia in 1952, I believe, and, and then winds up on this remote island for the rest of his life. I mean, there's no money there. You don't go there to get rich. You know, mm. and one of his cover stories that he told there was an American who passed through uh, roughly around that time, 1950s, I guess, who had passed through and met the guy by accident, and made a, a note about it in his notebook, which I reproduce on on my website. People can actually read the notebook there, mm. uh, in which he says this guy claimed he was there as part of something called ICA. Now, this is extremely revealing because ICA was a uh, an international relief organization, the forerunner of USAID, uh, which is the aid, the, the sort of U.S. aid agency that supposedly goes around the world and helps people with medical things and you know helps them with all sorts of you know water pollution and that sort of thing. This oh, is like okay. a, a formal U.S. government agency. It's been around for a long time, mm. but USAID has always suffered from accusations that it was a front for intelligence operations. Mm. Well. ICA was the first one. It was set up by John Foster Dulles. <laughs> okay, that, it stinks already. Yeah, it stinks already. Yeah, ICA was extremely political. It didn't last very long. It lasted, I think, for less than two years or something, if I'm not mistaken. It's in Hitler Legacy. Mm. Anyway, ICA lasts for a short time, but it has some very famous people involved with it. Uh, one of the people who worked for ICA briefly was George de Morenschild. Oh yeah, him again. Mm. Him again, mm. who was, you know, of course, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald's contact with the white Russian community and mm. possibly his CIA contact as well. Mm. Morin Schild worked in Yugoslavia for ICA, where he was arrested by the Yugoslav government for espionage. Right. Okay. Mm. So now here's this Austrian doctor who's not an American citizen, who's got nothing to do with, who hates the United States, actually, according to his documentation, Mm. and who claims that he's in the Indonesian archipelago on this remote island working for ICA. (laughs) I'm thinking, oh, come on. You know, this is not even funny anymore. But this is something that's told to this guy in the 1950s, an American tourist who's just passing through, right? So it's recorded. It's a, it's a, Beautiful document, you know, because it's recorded at a time when people just didn't know anything about this stuff. So here is Georg Anton Polk saying he's working for ICA. What a wonderful cover story that is. Totally bogus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it really suggests that American in- influences have a hand in this, yeah. CIA or someone uh, yeah. like that. Yeah. Exactly. And then it's, ju- it's not just Bowman and not just they're hiding out, they're actually protected. Yeah. Huh. So that's how he, I mean, his wife was going back and forth to Europe at least four times during the time she lived in Indonesia. You know how expensive that was in those days, still is. 
And takes a long time. But also. It takes a long time by ship going back and forth mm. four times. Where do they have the money for this? Mm. You know, where do they have the money to set up? I've, I've seen a photograph of a house that they lived in uh, on the island. It's quite nice. It's really a nice-looking uh, building. I mean, so much of this, I mean, of course, you can't measure in Western terms, especially the 1950s. It was extremely inexpensive to live in Indonesia in those days, mm. but you're still a foreigner. You still have a lot of other uh, things that you have to pay for and do as a foreigner living in Indonesia. Yeah. And you still have to, to function. I mean, you have to pay for all those trips back to Europe, you know, and you're not making money locally. The no. local people cannot afford to pay you, <laughs> except no, you not, get chickens or something, you know. It's not high, high-end high customers. <laughs> no, no, no. It's not a Park Avenue practice. <laughs> no. Do you know what I'm saying? He would be better off uh, having a clinic in Patagonia then, I think. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and another thing, you mentioned that he was a hypochondriac, and I just realized that, psychologically speaking, that's not the people who, who go and suicide themselves. That's no. the least likely suicide candidates. Sure, <laughs> so, because they're very squeamish about anything like yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> terrified of uh, sure. leaving. So that, And that suits Hitler's profile, I think. That most of these Nazis were cowards. Yeah. So, um, yeah. But you mentioned he had a wife there they're not ever brown by the way if ever brown or whoever was his wife before this muslim wife went so many times back and forth it must have been on his behalf because he didn't dare travel yes. or what do you think i believe so and i think that because no one was looking for eva brown she was perfectly safe traveling back and forth right. obviously not on an eva brown passport no. but she was traveling under an assumed name and nobody was looking for her nobody cared mm. so she was uh, free to do as she liked and the last trip she made coincidentally, was the same year that Ava Brown's father died. Uh, so it looked as though she was going back because he was sick, you know, yeah. and to attend a funeral or to be with him in his last days. Right. So that's what it appeared to be at the time. So another synchronicity, a coincidence maybe, but part of the story that kind of adds up and builds up this picture of, you know, Hitler and Ava living, living abroad in Indonesia. Huh. Uh, okay, I have a couple of more questions here. Um, but f before I go there, I just want to touch upon this family thing. Uh, we know that many of these, um, like Bormann, he had uh, family, uh, Rudolf Hass had family, and many of them were in the dark. But according to some of these Hitler re escape researchers, Hitler and Brown had children. At least they had a daughter, maybe even a son. This is the Argentina lead. Yep. Yep. Now, how, could this fit to, to with this story somehow? Is it any uh, traces of them having children in Indonesia, or or would the children be adults at this point when they went to Indonesia? No, they wouldn't, would they? They wouldn't. Not in no. the fifties, no. no. So if they had children, they would have to bring them. But there's no story of children, is there? Actually, there is. Is it? Wow. Yeah. Let's hear. In the in the original story that I uncovered in Indonesia, which published, as I say, in the Indonesian language, a kind of pamphlet, uh, there is an insistence that there was a young boy living with them. I then followed that up and found out from the documentation of the Indonesian doctor who visited them in 1960 that, yes, indeed, there was a child on the premises there, uh, a, a small blonde son. Huh. Um and there was, they had a child, at least one, that the doctor noticed that was living there. Um, there is a photograph, and it's a very badly damaged photograph, but it shows the couple with a small child in what looks like an Asian landscape. Really hard to make out. It's an old black and white photograph. But it appears that they, there was a child involved in this. Now, whether the child went back to Europe or stayed behind or whether the child was even theirs, there is no hard and fast documentation. But there was a strange story in that Indonesian book that this child had a name, and the name of the child was that of a person who turned out to be a very famous mass murderer in the United States. Wow. Uh, who was a very uh, pro-Nazi, uh, a neo-Nazi who was trying to kill members of other races. Jeez. He grew a Hitler mustache. Wow. Uh, he quoted, uh, he had Mein Kampf with him in the courtroom. And he would uh, speak German instead of speaking English when he was spoken to. He was sort of a vicious, you know, uh, uh, a Nazi. He was not, uh, he was the son of a woman who lived in the United States, according to what we know. 
Uh, I've been trying to find out as much as I can about this guy. He was very famous in Cleveland, which is where uh, he was arrested finally and executed not too long ago, actually a few years before I was even aware of him. Uh, he was uh, executed for his crime. He was on death row for you know, 20, 30 years, something like that, and finally executed. And I've been scouring the records, trying to come up with more information. No one really seems to know much about the childhood of this guy. But according to the story, he was the same person who was eventually arrested for, uh, you know, for, for crimes, for, for mass murder. I think he killed... But what did he do? Was he one of these famous American crazy white guys who just shoots around himself oh, oh, yeah. and kills at random? He was aiming specifically for, for black people, for Jewish people. He was looking to exterminate uh, racial enemies, quote-unquote. When, when did this happen? Uh, let me refresh my memory. This would have been... Uh, he was a young man in the 1960s, as I believe... And uh, the name of the boy was uh, Frank Spivak. He was a, like a notorious killer uh, in the United States in uh, 1982. Okay. He killed three people. He wounded other people uh, in Cleveland, Ohio. Wow. This guy was a neo-Nazi. He, he wanted to start a race war between black Jews and whites. Huh. He quoted Hitler all the time. He wore Hitler mustache. Uh, he was tried in 1983 and uh, eventually was sentenced to death and executed in the year 2011. Huh. So we're talking, you know, it was, he was the longest time of any American prisoner on death row. Wow. Uh, um, so so, what, so why, why did they give him that special favor? But how old was this guy? Uh, he was born... Uh, Spizak was born in 1951, uh, which is kind of the right time for our Indonesian doctor to have seen him in Indonesia in 1960, uh, because he felt the boy was somewhere between 7 and 10 years old. But, but why are you connecting him to this boy? It must be more than just Frank. No, no, no. The, the Indonesian doctor specifically says that the boy was Frank Spizak, or Spivak, ah. who lived with a woman called Gerda. Uh, with uh, the man he believes is Hitler and, and Eva Braun on this island. He said there was a small boy there, and he identified the boy as Frank Spivak. Now, I have a problem with this, yeah. because why would he remember the name so specifically? I think he was conflating things myself. I have, uh -huh. I have to leave the door open to that, because yeah, I yeah. think I mean, the, uh, roughly the right age, you know, all of this, but I have no data to show that the convicted murderer ever lived in Indonesia. But I don't know. I have no information that he didn't. I mean, there's just simply not enough information about this boy's childhood. But that's so weird, because from the 50s and onwards, isn't there enough information on all U.S. citizens to know where they're coming from and where they're born and the census and all that? Uh, you'd be surprised. I mean, we have the information as to where he was born. We know Spivak was born in the United States, or at least we, we have records of a birth record yeah, of being yeah. born in Cleveland, Ohio, I think, in, in that time. But yeah. we don't know about his childhood, those pieces of his childhood uh, that are missing from the public record that I, I haven't been able to find yet. And I've talked to the reporters who worked on the case and who covered his execution, and even they don't have access to the information. Mm -hmm. I've contacted the prison where he was held, and they don't have it. So it's been kind of around and around in circles on trying to find more information. But I have the feeling this is a case of mistaken identity by the Indonesian doctor because the boy was arrested, I mean the killer was arrested in 1982 and went to trial in 1983, which was at the same time that the Klaus Barbie revelations were coming out, mm -hmm. the Hitler Diaries hoax was coming out, mm -hmm. and all the rest of this that convinced the Indonesian doctor to go public with his story. Mm -hmm. But of one thing there is no doubt, there was a boy living with Georg Anton Poik and his wife, Hella Poik, on this island in the middle of nowhere. He was a European boy. He was blonde, according to the photograph that I saw. Mm. Uh, he was wearing short pants and all the rest of it. So it looks as though, was this their child? Was this a child visiting them from somewhere for some reason? Mm. Uh, I don't know. But there was a child on site uh, in 1960 when he was visited. So, Well, if they did have children, it would probably, and if they cared for their children, it would, and, and I mean, it's not that long ago, and probably to a certain degree still in Britain, that uh, many put their children away on school, you know, upper class have done this, sure. and, and to protect them, they would probably get them away from yeah. uh, Eva and Adolf, if if they had children and they care for them. So uh, so it's not that far-fetched, but of course there's no evidence, but it's easy to, to buy the story, right? Because sure. here we have this hateful, crazy guy 
yeah. <laughs> who runs up like a mass murderer, must be Hitler's son. Well, and he, and, he, and he dressed like Hitler and talked like Hitler. You know, he <laughs> yeah. did everything perfectly. Right? <laughs> a father complex there. Yeah, yeah. But also, it's kind of suspicious that we don't... I mean, how, mo- how many stones hasn't been turned regarding, let's say, Charles Manson and other famous, you know, bad guys? Why would this guy be protected and unknown and mysterious? That's a bit suspicious. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. Why 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 is the information so hard to get? Uh, I think Manson's case, he was uh, a famous case, much more famous than this guy in the 80s, I guess. Mm. Um, they caught him relatively quickly. He had killed three people. He wounded a few others. Uh, he, from our point of view, was obviously insane. Um, he was even a cross-dresser. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. So, well, many Nazis had that tendency. Yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> you know. So we have, you know, we have a very strange individual. But I guess no, he wasn't running a cult. He didn't have a whole bunch of followers like Manson. So I guess they figured he's an anomaly, and let's not pay any more attention to him. You know, uh, not give him the benefit of, of that kind of attention. And I can understand that, I guess. But uh, I would like to know more about him, though, just for the sake of putting this one story to bed once and for all. Yeah. That's uh, that's the duty of a proper researcher. But yeah. uh, what about uh, his second wife and the house? Now, did you go to the house? There must be clues there. And did you talk to the second wife? No, that's another interesting story. The second wife. Now, this is something that's going to cause people, you know, a lot of consternation. <laughs> the second wife was the source of the documentation that uh, that the Indonesian doctor eventually got. He went and visited the wife in the 1980s, I believe, or the 1970s, to really put to bed once and for all, who was this guy? He interviewed the second wife. The second wife was no longer living on that island. Oh. She left that island shortly after her husband died, after the Austrian doctor died. And she wound up back in Bandung, um, which is a city a, a little bit south of Jakarta. And the Indonesian doctor talked to her, got her uh, statement. She talked about her husband. She talked about her how her husband told her he was Hitler. Wow. Okay, which again is hearsay. We don't know if this if this is true or if it is true. What does it mean really? Maybe he was just trying to claim something for himself that wasn't. But he was extremely secretive. She knew he wasn't really a doctor. She tells that you know right up front. So he tells her, no, I am Hitler. You've heard about Hitler. You know about Germany and all of this. Well, I am Hitler. He tells his wife Mm. before he dies. So she tells the story to the Indonesian doctor. However, later, when people go back, including me, to go and find this woman and talk to her, she's living on a in a compound where across the street from uh, the University of Bandung in Indonesia, mm-hmm. which is surrounded by bodyguards and uh, uh, government personnel. Wow. You do not, you're not allowed to have access to this person, who it seems to still be alive. Uh, the Indonesian doctor has since died, but she seems to be alive. The, uh, the the second wife seems to still be alive, living in. Hang on, who's in charge? Oh, is this the same kind of government today? Well, no. Of course, Suharto's government has fallen. Uh, we've gone through a couple of presidents in Indonesia since then, but still, she is considered protected. So, it's, it's not a normal democratic uh, country today. Oh, it is, but you know, normal by whose you know standing. Yeah, yeah. The army is still very powerful in Indonesia. Uh, and intelligence services, I bet. Yeah. And intelligence services. And they always have. Power. They're powerful yeah. everywhere, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so she's being protected. You can't get to her. Huh. Now, local Indonesian reporters have tried to do this, and they've written a book about it, a small pamphlet sort of, which I I've, I have as well. Mm-hmm. And I've tried to contact them, and it's been really difficult because uh, they try to get access to her, and they could not also because of the the presence of intelligence types or something around her. She is not giving interviews. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but what about the house? Then is that accessible? The house on the island is not accessible. In the first place, we don't really quite know where it is. It was remote at the best of times. Uh, The island itself, Sumbawa, is accessible, but not accessible all the time. A couple of days a week, uh, a ship stops by between Bali and Lombok. No, actually, Bali, Lombok, Sumbawa, and then where the Komodo dragons are uh, on those islands. So it's really next door to Komodo dragons territory. Uh, So it's not really on the main tourist run. It's difficult of access, and once you get to Sumbawa Basar, 
uh, the city, the, the town of Sumbawa. Trying to get from there inland is very, very tricky. It's a four-wheel drive situation, mm. and no one seems to know anything about where this guy's house is. It's very difficult of access. Hmm. Well, it sounds like the perfect hideout place. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Anybody showing up there is going to be noticed immediately, mm. and the the uh, the communication systems are such that you know your presence on that island is telegraphed to everyone who right. might have a, a need to know or an interest to know. It's really difficult to do any kind of research there. Exactly. So I think that even if there are people still around who could tell you something, the powers that be would immediately, uh, they're probably already scared away from saying anything, those who would. Know. Yeah, yeah. As a person of European ethnicity like I am, it would be extremely difficult. Yeah. Local Indonesians had a hard enough time. Uh, and they did, you know, go there and try to get information and try to understand more of what was going on. Mm. And we're getting all kinds of, of stories, uh, strange stories that they could not verify, they could not validate. So we're we're kind of stuck with a lot of rumors and 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 hearsay. Mm. Still, the pictures are out. Uh, that's good. Uh, did he have uh, his famous chaplain moustache on his pictures? Oh or? yes, absolutely. He he kept that. Oh, he my kept God. that or threw it back or whatever. <laughs> That's why. I mean, he he looked, you know, like I say, he looked like Hitler, the young Hitler in, in the trenches. Uh, it's a remarkable resemblance, and he loved the mustache and his passport photo uh, that he used under the the name of Georg Anton Puch also has that mustache. You know, so it's it's weird. <laughs> Telling you, it's very strange for an Austrian to wear that mustache yeah, after the war <laughs> and to go abroad. Yeah. I mean, come on, you know. Yeah, if that's not an indication. Yeah. But but what about the real Georg Anton? Do we know anything about him? Other than the fact that that he was a medical officer of Salzburg Gau, he was a Nazi Party member. He lied about that to the American authorities. And in 1946, the American authorities finally realized they had a live one here, and uh, they were going to arrest him and put him into the uh, the prison camp. He heard about it just in enough time, and he escaped. And I reproduce in the Hitler legacy the wanted advertisement that the Allied authorities put for him and his wife no. in the local newspapers offering a reward for their capture. Mm. Uh, he was not captured. He made his way into northern Italy. His wife followed soon thereafter. And uh, then there's this, this missing period of time, from but, 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 but hang on, at this point, it could be the real one, right? At this point, it could be the real one, sure. Because he had reasons to go away. Yes, he did. But then he wouldn't use his own name, would he? That's my point. Right. You know, then by 1952 or so, he's using his own name yeah. in a passport under his own name, if that is him. Yeah. And he's, you know, blithely, you know, wandering out of the country. <laughs> and he picked the time in 1952 when the Swiss government had relaxed their control over Nazi assets in their banks. Right. There was a time in the immediate post-war period when those assets were frozen. By 1952, that was relaxed. Mm. And suddenly, I have indication that he went to Switzerland briefly. He went to another bank in Germany on his way out of Antwerp to Jakarta. So there's this motion that's taking place of somebody using this man's name in the 1950s in Switzerland and in Europe, uh, excuse me, in Germany, uh, accessing money, evidently, and then getting out of the country. Hmm. Hmm. But between 1946 and 52, I don't know where this guy was. No. Hmm. That's so interesting. Yeah. So actually, if it was him who, who went away to Italy first, then the traditional Hitler escape scenario could be intact. Absolutely. And then went to Argentina and then yeah. left Argentina and came back, picked up the money, picked up the cash and went to Indonesia with a black bag full of gold bullion or something. Who knows? Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, under Bormann's protection has to be yeah. and and the CIA. Not Jewish. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Wunderbar. I think we've covered. Is there anything, any aspects to this story that should be added to or do we have... Um, mentioned the most important parts I think we've covered the highlights of, of this story mm. certainly um, you know the, my books cover it of course in much more detail yeah. uh, but there's other people who've done research along similar lines you've mentioned Joseph Farrell and of course the other authors that you'll be talking to mm. but there's also the, uh, the, 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 the couple that wrote uh, the book called The Gold Warriors 
um, which is an important study of how a lot of the financing, post-war financing took place, uh, the buried gold, uh, the Nazi gold reserves, the Japanese gold reserves, and that impinges on this story in, in a couple of places. So it talks even about Nixon and, you know, Nixon's cutting deals with Japan on repatriating some Japanese gold and all the rest of it. So the political uh, aspect of the story is covered in the Seagraves work called The Gold Warriors, and that's something that's you know, has also uh, connections to this whole story, very valuable piece of, of work. And, of course, I also used a lot of the U.S. government's recently declassified uh, files on searching for Nazi gold and the fact that they're scratching their heads. They come up with some of it, but they can't come up with all of it. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of it that's been missing. There's no trace of. Some of the gold wound up in the United States uh, at various banks in New York. Um, and then a lot of it just went missing completely. We have no idea where it went. But you, you did say a couple of times that there's more info that you're sitting on that you're, you're so yes. far not allowed to release. Is that info that will, obviously you can't tell us what it is, but you can tell us what kind of info it is. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it fills in a lot of the blanks. It fills in ah. a lot of the blanks in the story of George uh, Anton Puch. It fills in some of that, fills in some of the, uh, the, the extent of the rat lines that he was involved with. Uh, it includes some famous personalities that I can't, unfortunately mentioned yet um, that were involved with the rat line uh, uh, sort of iconic figures that were very much involved the addresses phone numbers names are in this particular address book mm -hmm. that was in this man's possession when he died in 1970 so there was a in Indonesia so there's a lot of you know it's it fills out it fleshes out the story it's not going to be I think uh, shocking revelations I'm not going to have the smoking gun that this is Hitler mm -hmm. but I'm going to have a lot more information that will go you know, strongly sort towards suggesting that this might be so. Yeah.